Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Nazia Iqbal. It's the 7th of December 2023 and here are the questions we will be answering today. What does a deeper dive into Q2 GDP numbers reveal? Could the Chennai calamity have been avoided? How will the RBI monetary policy impact markets? And what are trading hours? Indian economy expanded by 7.6% in the second quarter of this financial year, much higher than the Monetary Policy Committee's projection of 6.5%. The pace of expansion surprised most economists even as RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das had dropped hints about it during a business standard summit. But what does the fine print tell us? What are the details that stand out? Bashwar Kumar speaks to experts to find out. India's gross domestic product grew at 7.6% in the September quarter of 2023-24, surprising experts and economists. But RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das had some inkling. Looking at the momentum of economic activity, looking at a few early data points which have come in, a few early indicators, I can say that the second quarter GDP number, as and when it is released at the end of November, in all probability, will surprise everyone on the upside. Manufacturing and construction activities led the charge. Both expanded by double digits. The Q2 print indicated that economic recovery was well on track for 6.7% growth in FY24. The manufacturing and construction sectors clocked robust nine-quarter high growth. The strong manufacturing growth was driven by a surge in listed company profits. The construction sector benefited from the front-loading of capex by the centre and states. But growth in services slowed down. At just 5.8%, the slowdown in the services sector to a six-quarter low was driven by the trade, hotels, transport and communication services subsector. Well, I think the services had rebounded very strongly, so they are now correcting. I think if you look at the even the PMI for services, that is slowly coming down. I think the data came out for November today. It shows a moderation over uh, October also. So I think services and now services are slowing, but at the same time, goods, which is manufacturing, is picking up. I think that's going to be a global global trend. I think uh, it's not specific to India. You can see that the air traffic or uh, uh, hotels, restaurants, I think in general, I think they had remained very strong. So over a high base, I think there'll be some softening that, that takes place, but it's take, it's, it will be replaced by uh, the manufacturing sector as we saw in the data. Uh, and manufacturing PMI, by the way, uh, went up in November compared to uh, compared to October. In the same September quarter, the agriculture sector saw the slowest expansion in the past 18 quarters at just 1.2%. This is because growth was weighed down by a weak and erratic monsoon. It also suggests that rural demand is under stress, which has prevented consumption demand from being broad-based. This is also reflected in the subdued sales of FMCG products in rural areas. The agriculture sector, first of all, has done uh, very well uh, since the pandemic struck. I think we've grown stronger uh, at a much faster rate than the trend rate. Now, so the base is also quite large in agriculture. Uh, now, the, the, the errant monsoons are playing out. But agriculture estimates are subject to subject to change. And what uh, what we need to watch out for is uh, what kind of growth we see in the allied sectors, the allied activities, animal husbandry, etc etc which typically tend to offset this year for sure we'll see slower than the trend rate of growth that we have seen in the last three four years how much i think is very hard to predict another point that stood out is private consumption which is taken as a proxy for household consumption growth in private final consumption expenditure or private spending slowed down to 3.1 percent this was due to the continuing distress in rural demand Private capex too remained weak. On the consumption side and on the expenditure side aggregates in general, 
initial data gets revised a lot because there are data availability issues. And uh, so I, I don't usually get terribly swayed by what is coming out of these aggregates. Having said that, I do believe that consumption is a story of urban versus rural. And going ahead, I do believe that rural demand is going to be quite cautious given how we are setting up for the agricultural outlook. And that's not looking very good right now. So private investment hasn't become very broad based, uh, but uh, I think it is uh, showing signs of a pickup. The government will have to withdraw because they have uh, uh, fiscal concerns over the medium run. I think they have to reduce the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, they have a medium term fiscal consolidation plan. Uh, so the baton will have to be picked up by the private sector. The focus now should shift towards uh, pushing private investment via making the environment more friendlier because corporates are in good health. I mean, the mid and the large size corporates have very good balance sheets and they are in a position to invest at this uh, at this juncture. One of the less encouraging points that stood out among the Q2 numbers was that demand was primarily driven by the government, both in terms of consumption and investment. Government spending picked up and grew at 12.4% in real terms indicating that both the centre and state governments expanded their public expenditure. Because of the front-loading of CAPEX by the government, gross fixed capital formation, which represents investment demand in the economy, grew at a five-quarter high of 11%. So going forward, we expect the pace of growth of uh, CAPEX by the centre and the states to slow down quite a lot in the second half as compared to the first half. In the second half of the year, we've had the assembly elections. Then we will have the model code of conduct coming in potentially sometime in the next quarter before we go into parliamentary elections. And uh, with all of this, we do expect that the pace of uh, CAPEX is going to slow down. Now, in the month of October, we had a 15% contraction in Government of India's CAPEX already. Around 5 trillion is left compared to the budget estimates to be completed in H2. So there is really a lot of headroom. We do expect that the budgeted targets will be missed both by the centre uh, and by the states. Overall, the Q2 numbers left a positive impression on the experts. But there were some caveats. To me, what was really surprising was the manufacturing and construction uh, growth numbers. Those were the kind of numbers I expected for Q1, not for Q2. So I'm really curious to see whether we're going to end up seeing some rebalancing between these two quarters when the eventual uh, revision uh, uh, comes through uh, going forward. So perhaps growth will end up being revised higher for Q1 and slightly lower for Q2. It's a very strong uh, rate of growth, 7.6%. And by the way, I should also point out that in the third quarter, many other economies also outperformed. US grew at 5.2%, China also grew above 6%. So I think there, have, there are other countries also which grew, but I think India does stand out because it's a pretty large economy and it has sustained a, a pretty strong uh, uh, rate of growth. And this year, there is absolutely no doubt that India will be the fastest growing G20 country. Uh, so it's a very strong momentum. Not every sector is doing well, uh, but I think overall there are, there, is, there are bits of good news in this number. While growth momentum has continued so far, challenges await the economy. Most economists say the growth rate will come down significantly in the second half of the year. The RBI's State of the Economy report has also said that the central bank is preparing for an anticipated uptick in inflation readings for November and December. But an impressive growth doesn't always translate into good infrastructure which can withstand nature's test. Heavy rains triggered by a cyclone have once again brought several parts of Chennai and nearby districts to a standstill. Despite spending hundreds of crores on building storm water drains, there is no end to flooding. So could the Chennai calamity have been avoided? Kasturi Akhil caught up with Jaya Dindor of World Resources Institute, an NGO that studies urban challenges and offers solutions to make cities more livable and sustainable. Let's listen in to the interview.
The recent deluge in Chennai triggered by cyclone Mai Chong has once again drawn emphasis to the fact that how Indian cities with every year passing is turning more and more vulnerable to the high risks of uh, climate-induced disasters. Therefore, to help us understand the criticality of climate change-induced extreme weather events and how can urban India cope with it, Today, we have with us Jaya Dhindor, Executive Program Director of Sustainable Cities, WRI India, on the Business Standard Morning Show. Hello, Jaya. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure having you on our show. Is the Chennai flood a result of extreme weather events indeed? And are Indian cities prepared for such events? If not, why? Uh, hi, Kasturi, and thank you for having me on your show. Uh, so to start with and answer your question, yes, absolutely, uh, Michong has brought more rain than the 2015 cyclone in Chennai, for example. Parts of Chennai recorded about 53 to 54 centimeters of rainfall over a 48-hour period, right, between December 2nd and 4th. Uh, some stations have much higher numbers, and this is over half of the annual rainfall in Bangalore, right, just to give you a comparison. Uh, so as per IMD, the warmed-up atmosphere is leading to massive rains over shorter durations now, and that's what's happening climatically. And are Indian cities prepared for such events? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Uh, and that's not just Indian cities, right? Globally, we are actually not prepared, we are underprepared for this. Uh, and these are there are three reasons for that. For example, one is that the infrastructure capabilities of cities were not designed to handle the kind of events that we are seeing these days. Uh, the second reason is really the sprawling form of urban development, which is largely unplanned, having built up in ecologically sensitive and low-lying zones uh, being you know, a big issue. Uh, Chennai also has a relatively flat terrain, which makes the draining of the water difficult. So while it floods, the water doesn't seep out very easily. Uh, and so you, you see this pattern you know, keeps on repeating itself one city after another. Sometimes it is Mumbai, Bangalore, you know, Delhi, Himachal, and across the country. Like you said, that all these cities, their uh, storm water drainage, the, their drain sizes are undersized and they're not equipped to handle uh, more than estimated uh, rainfall. Drawing from that, my next question to you is that how much worse do you think that these uh, extreme weather and climate change indu induced uh, weather events can get? And um, how will they be different from the earlier flooding that we've witnessed before in the country? So we now know that extreme weather events will become more frequent and more severe, uh, not just in India, but across the world. And the risks are no more theoretical, right? And you mentioned the IPCC and the kind of statistics that it kind of has talked about. So previously, a lot of the flooding we were seeing, uh, we used to see, you know, and I'm talking about like 30 years ago or, or you know, 20 years ago, was mostly riverine. So it was what is known as fluvial flooding or coastal due to storm surges. Uh, but now what's happening is we are seeing more of pluvial floods or surface water and flash floods, and those have become more extensive, which means that when you build up and there's a lot of gray area, the water has nowhere to go, it basically means that unless cities plan for their growth properly, embed resilience measures in infrastructure development, and secure the vulnerable populations, we will just keep seeing recurring scenarios of increased loss and damage to life, productivity, you know, work, property, everything. So extreme weather, we also know, comes at a staggeringly high cost. Uh, and you know, a UN report published earlier this year showed that uh, between 1970 and 2021, some 12,000 reported disasters from weather, climate, and water extreme caused about 4.3 trillion in economic losses, right? And most of them were in developing countries, unfortunately. So this is something that we need to be mindful of. The flooding scenario, yes, has changed uh, over time. And uh, like I said, the frequency and the severity of this is just going to keep uh, developing and getting worse. On the policy uh, side and on the infra side, how, how is that going to be managed? Uh, I think one is that cities need to develop climate action and resilience plans that are central to and coherent with other statutory plans like development plans. The second is we also need to develop SOPs and RFPs for infrastructure development and management that takes into account climate vulnerabilities. The third thing is that we need to have very, very stringent rules and enforcement for protection of ecological assets and sensitive areas in cities. We can no longer afford to build, you know, 
wherever land is cheaper, for example, which is on the outskirts and the fringes of the city and where the ecological assets often reside. The fourth thing is that, you know, we need to create plans for upgradation of infrastructures carrying capacities. Uh, like I said, you know, some of that was not anticipated and therefore your infrastructure is, you know, 40 years, 50 years, 100 year old in some cases like Kolkata. And then finally, we need to figure out and prioritize financing for such infrastructure, right? Like how do we fund this infrastructure? Where does the money come from? How do we kind of as a city, uh, you know, come collectively towards, you know, building and financing this kind of infrastructure is something that cities need to do on a priority basis. I read somewhere that Indian, uh, the urban planners, they're not that, they don't pay attention to the land use patterns and how to uh, incorporate land use analysis and assessment into their urban planning. But there's more attention uh, on accommodating the rampant urban sprawl. So uh, what do you have to say about that, ma'am? Is that true? See, um, I'm an urban planner by training, so I can I can talk about this a little bit. Uh, when I went through sort of training, right, in urban planning, this was over 20 years ago, climate change, climate disasters were not a conversation even at that time, right? So when we were doing all of this, uh, these are things that we have come to learn, know about as, you know, cities are facing these problems, right? So the traditional models of urban planning definitely look at sort of land use patterns and accommodating, you know, like building compact cities and all of that. Mind you, these are also very important mitigation efforts, right? But the important thing now, the central tenet of, you know, urban planning is definitely going to be around climate resilience and how do we adequately incorporate it. And that is why, like I said earlier, we need to understand how to bring coherence between all of our development plans, all of our statutory plans that apply to a city, that apply to a region or a district, and ensure that climate resilience is at the heart of it. So that was it. Uh, thank you so much, Jaya. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us on the Business Standard Morning Show. Thank you very much, Kasturi. It was a pleasure being here. Moving on, all eyes are on the three-day meeting of RBI's rate-setting panel. Its decision, which will be announced tomorrow on December 8th, remains a crucial trigger for equity markets, which are holding on to their recent strength and making record highs. Harshita Singh's report tells us what is expected from Friday's RBI policy, its likely impact on equity markets and other factors that will be watched out. In less than two weeks, equity benchmark indices have soared 5%, reaching fresh highs on positive domestic and global queues. The Reserve Bank of India's monetary policy outcome on Friday is now the next crucial event that the Lal Street is eyeing. The RBI, meanwhile, is expected to stand pat on the benchmark repo rate on Friday, holding it steady at 6.5% for the fifth consecutive policy review. The status quo, experts say, will likely remain in place until the U.S. Federal Reserve initiates rate cuts. We expect a status quo in the policy. We are expecting that RBI will stick with this withdrawal accommodation stance because inflation has still not come to 4%. But it is within the tolerant band of around 4 to 6% right now. The policy is sufficiently restrictive. So over a period of time, you should see the inflation coming towards 4% levels. And that is the time when actually RBI will have some room for him to cut rate, which we expect will happen in the next year. So that means our view is that uh, maybe September will be the time when the rate cut will happen. And now going forward, what we expect is that um, the US also is expected to cut rate. So that will also give us some more comfort. So we expect RBI rate cuts will will not be before the Fed rate cut. It will be after the Fed rate cut. So whenever the Fed starts cutting rate, our market also will breathe easy and the rate cuts will happen. As regard to domestic equities, analysts say the policy is unlikely to change the market's course, which is currently rallying, driven by hopes of political continuity on BJP's state election win. The RBI policy this time is unlikely to be terribly consequential for equity markets uh, because uh, the markets are currently being uh, driven more by sentiment around um, strengthening uh, consumer and capex demand as well as the recent election results uh, which returned bjp uh, uh, to power in in three of the four major states that went for polls this time 
That said, some key things that markets will closely watch out for include RBI governor's remarks on last month's tightening of unsecured consumer credit norms. Additionally, any moves on systemic liquidity, which has remained in deficit last month, will also be eyed, especially by bond investors. Analysts, however, expect RBI to be cautious on any further open market operation or OMO sales ahead, given the prevailing tight conditions. Uh, don't expect too much of a uh, of an overreach um, in terms of liquidity with RBI coming in with um, greater OMOs or, or measures around CRR. Besides, an increase in the GDP forecast for the current financial year is also likely after the upward surprise in the second quarter GDP print. Today, on 7th December, global markets and crude oil prices will provide cues for Dalal Street. He's making plans for an early retirement. Business Standard Staying with the markets theme, the National Stock Exchange is mulling deferring indefinitely the internal deadlines set for extending trading hours. Longer trading hours are expected to enhance the profitability and volumes of the country's top boss. In today's explainer segment, Raghav Agarwal tells more about trading hours. Trading hours is a time span during which a stock exchange is open. During this period, shares and derivatives are bought and sold. In India, the stock market is open for five days a week from Monday to Friday. A trading day is divided into three main categories. These are the pre-opening session, regular trading session and post-closing session. The pre-opening session is between 9 a.m. and 9 8 a.m. During this small window, the investors can place orders for buying and selling of securities. The orders placed during this period are given priority once the market opens. The regular trading session operates from 9.15 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. During this period, the regular trading of stocks takes place. The prices of stocks get fixed due to their demand and supply. The post-closure session operates from 3.40 p.m. to 4.00 p.m. During this period, investors are allowed to place bids for the next trading day. Also, these deals are executed at the pre-agreed price irrespective of the next day's opening price. These bids can be cancelled during the next day's pre-opening session. On Diwali, the stock market opens for a special trading window to mark the auspicious start of the new Samwat. The one-hour window is called the Mahurat Trading Hour. The timing of this window is not fixed and changes every year. NSE wanted SEBI to allow a special trading session for index derivatives between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. According to the report, NSE said it would help investors cash in on the international events as well. This would, in return, increase the trading volume and thus the profitability of the exchange. It was expected to roll out the feature by March next year. Last month, SEBI chairperson Madhubi Puri Butch said that the proposal to extend trading hours required more consultation with other key stakeholders. I'm backed by the nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. But, citing industry sources, Business Standard suggested that brokers and investors are not as keen on the proposal to extend trading hours as the stock exchanges are. Well, that's all we have for you today. For more news and analysis, please log on to business-standard.com. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.